Hello. Hey, Christian, how are you? Okay, and you? Okay. So generally, after you launch to YouTube, I, I get rid of it. You could see on the top left, now you know we're live. We know we're on YouTube. Yep. That will make you feel fine. And now I'm going to make Howard and Andrew co-chairs, and I'm going to hand it to them. And we are co-chairs. You mean co-hosts. Co-hosts, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good point. There's this special secret ceremony that I've been talking about. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the double co-chair appointment. Yeah. So they're going to be now both co-chairs, and, and then I'm going to help them on uh, votes or anything that they may need from time to time. Ken, I like your, your background. You want to make uh, Colleen a, a panelist. Yep, and then the last thing, Ken, is just, I mean, uh, uh, um, I should say, Rich, generally I sort of peruse the attendees list because sometimes some of our, our board members come in and I'm looking through and Colleen is there. So we're going to make Colleen a panelist. And now she is. I, I sometimes look for others. And then um, sometimes if guest speakers come in or guest speakers come for future ones, you move them back and forth. But that's the process. And I will now hand it to Howard and Andrew. Thank you for just letting me talk, Doug, through that to start the meeting. Sure. is on who's going to be a panelist, right? You want to get started, Andrew? We have sure. uh, 631 here. Welcome yes. everyone to the April meeting of the Transportation Committee of Community Board 7. We have a light agenda tonight, um, but I guess two important issues. Uh, the first issue was brought to us by a Andrew and it's it's a really important issue. Do you want to introduce it, Andrew? Yeah, I, I just think um, I told um, our speaker to, uh, to come at 6.40 because um, I believe Roberta has a message for, uh, is doing every committee at the beginning um, about the budget uh, process. Uh, Andrew, she's on the attendee list right now. She needs to be made a panelist. Thank you. So um, who is it? Leah Flax. Yes, yeah. Leah cool. should be a panelist for sure. I'll take care of it. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Roberta, you're up. Okay, thanks. So we're, um, the budget, and strategy committee is has we're working on a shorter timeline this year because we're just getting started now in April. So I sent the co-chairs the timeline. We'll eventually send it around to everybody. But we're looking at the year July 22 to June 23. Uh, this year the budget priorities are going to be limited to 20. So it'll be the top 20, but all of those that don't, because transportation usually has a few. The ones that don't make it to the top 20 in, in both capital and expense will go in a letter to DOT spec specifying what, you know, not in any particular order, but what they are. Um, we, I, we're sending around criteria for how you select your budget priorities, but I just wanted to explain the, the process very quickly. Um, starting in April, we're gonna ask each committee to um, start looking at who their stakeholders are and start scheduling meetings with them in the coming for, for um, May and, and June. So in, in May, we hope you'll meet with your stakeholders, review any data that you need to look at. Um, in June, finish your stakeholder meetings, draft your committee needs and priorities, vote on your both your district needs and your priorities in at the July meeting um, at September, we're going to hold a public hearing on the district needs and priorities prior to the steering committee meeting. At the steering committee in September, not in October, but in September this year, we're gonna vote on the uh, order of the priorities and then we'll have a full vote at the October meeting. If something changes in, in September, we can always add it at the um, September steering or at the full board. Uh, this year will give us time to get get everything done on time instead of us, you know, rushing to get everything late. Andrew, I'm assuming that a lot of the t the MTA and the TA stuff may may change over the summer. Yes, and as that's a state agency, um, you know, the city budget has very little to say about it. Uh, although it does have something to say about uh, police, and, and you're going to hear more about that tonight. But um, you know, Roberta, the irony is that you said meet with your stakeholders. Basically, every resident in CB7 is a stakeholder of our committee. Exactly. <laughs> but but you know, we're going to publicize the 
you know, in the past, we've not had um, a big hearing. Be now with Zoom, this past um, October, we had a huge crowd at the meeting. So we want to yeah. give, you know, because we now have Zoom and people can log in, we, we want to make sure that everything's in place so that early September, we can have a discussion. If you want to have uh, more publicity for your July transportation meeting to discuss some of these things, we'll help you publicize it. Great. Now, has this schedule, this new schedule, which is a little bit compressed, been sent to every uh, CB7 member? No, it's, be, it's going to be sent. Right now, okay. it's just going to the committee chairs. Oh, okay. To okay, clarify, great. it's going to be announced at steering. And then the reason why Roberta is coming now is because every committee meeting before steering, she's coming to, we'll announce that it's steering again, <clears throat> and then we'll start a wider process to clarify. But Roberta will be presenting at steering. Okay, um, Steve, if we want to discuss some of our past um, budget priorities, both expense and capital, um, somebody in the office can send this to us so we can discuss this and see what has changed, what we want to remove, what we might want to add um, for our next meeting. We can try and find it. Yeah, yeah, that would be helpful, I think. I think we could try and find it. won't be at the office. It'll be, you know, the, the committee right now because that's who's doing the, until we get into a oh, new okay. district manager. But I think Roberta would answer more than I can answer. She may be able to find it. We'll, we'll look for it. We'll certainly do the best we can do. Great. Howard, anything to add? No, no. I just was wondering if it's possible. I, I suggested this last year and I was told it, 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 it's impossible, but I just, it's worth trying again. Have us just simply vote on the parties so we don't spend hours going through them. And then I think sometimes the, the party list is a little bit haphazard. It has, it depends on who speaks up at that particular time. Is it possible to just have a, at least a preliminary ranking of the parties by having us yeah. vote? I, yes, I guess so, no, how, how are, to answer that, we have um, in the thing that I sent you today, we have a list of how to select your priorities. And then we're asking each committee to prioritize the two or three things that are most important for them. I, you know, basically some committees don't have any priorities, so it, it'll be more transportation parks, um, probably housing. Oh, is there I a way, Roberta? I, I, just to say, Howard, it, it, the answer is, Howard, is we are talking about ways to make the process simpler and easier, right. and we'll keep you informed. Right. And we understand your comments, and it's being addressed, and we're going to try and make it sl sleep, you know, a little bit uh, more efficient than in the past. Steve, okay. I may have asked this. I may have asked this last year, but because each committee's priorities are important to them, is there a way that the committees can list it, send it to the full board, and then the full board said this is our committee's priorities, rather than taking their turn at prioritizing each one so that some slip way back. I think that's a good idea. And I, I mean, again, I don't want to speak for Roberta. I think we're taking into a couple of considerations on the best way to do so. And if you'd like to share that with the budget committee and myself, but I think I that there's been an active conversation to way yeah. to make it more efficient. And I think that's still a conversation, but it's been acknowledged that we can make it a little more efficient. And that's the goal. Is that the we right? have We're also going to have a letter with the priorities for each committee going to the appropriate agency. Agent. So most of, DO, most of transportation will go to DOT, but some of it may go to the police. And the other piece is that I, I hope going forward is that we put this in a database so that at any point during the year, you can pull it up and see, you know, if you've asked for a particular thing, ha has it happened? Yes. You, is it likely to happen? <laughs> is there money for it? it? You know, where where is it in the process? So all right, we're, great. We're hoping to expedite all of that. But I think we can make it more efficient. And I know Roberta is leading that charge and, and we'll come back to you to acknowledge that. I think we can do a better process job. Great. Okay. All right, then um, let's get to our, our first item of business. Um, we're fortunate to once again have um, Leah Flax of New York City Transit Government and Community Relations with us this evening. Um, many people have seen the um, incredible news coverage of some of the crimes that have taken place 
in our subway system, um, crime is actually down, but um, some of these certainly do make headlines and are horrific. Um, obviously, New York City Transit and the MTA have asked um, the city of New York for additional police. We have 644. Um, many folks, uh, including Sarah Feinberg, interim president of New York City Transit, doesn't believe it's near enough, and I don't either, um, because we want to make our workers and our riders feel and be safe. Um, folks often say the two C's are keeping them out of the subway, COVID and crime. Um, apparently, crime has overtaken COVID now, and we need to do something about it. So um, Leah Flax will tell us uh, what is being done and what the statistics mean and what they actually don't mean. Um, so Leah, take it away and thank you again. Thank you so much for having me, um, for having me again. And it's good to see uh, many of the same faces, some with new exciting backgrounds. Um, so I am really happy to, to be joining. Um, I need uh, sharing enabled, please. Um, and I do have a few slides. That was a great introduction um, about what I'm going to be talking about. And I'm not sure you now. Okay, let me try it. Okay. You should be able to share. Sorry about that, Leah. No problem. See? There we go. All right, wonderful. I'm good, I'm good at this, man. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so let me just uh, jump in. So on the CB7, um, agenda for today, uh, this was actually listed as safety and crime matters. And I just wanted to touch briefly on it because it got me thinking about, well, there is actually a difference between safety and crime. And for the MTA, we obviously care a lot about um, both. And so safety issues can also be things like people tripping and falling in the subway, buses having an accident, and what's been on everyone's mind is coronavirus. That's a safety issue. But really what you guys were interested in today is, is crime. So when we're talking about safety today, we're talking about crime and policing. Um, but really, you know, all of these things are super important to us. And we're working every day to make sure that our customers are, and our system are safe. Um, so in addition to, you know, safety, being not just crime, um, crime is not just statistics, it's also perception. Um, so what people feel and the perception is also really important to us. We want people in the system to be safe and we really want them to feel safe. That's really, really uh, important to us. So I just put some things on here that might go into, you know, each individual is going to vary a lot what makes them feel safe. Um, but some things that I think factor into that are not just, you know, incidents happening on the lines you take in your neighborhood, but things happening elsewhere in the system. So you might be somebody who uses parks. You hear about something that happened in a park in faraway Queens. That doesn't make you feel unsafe but you, you ride the sub when you hear about something that happened in faraway Queens, that might make you feel unsafe because it's a system and people move on the system and it all is very connected. Um, something else might be, you know, cleanliness. Dirt is not a crime, but if you see a lot of dirt and garbage, it, it might make you feel unsafe. Um, something that comes up a lot, presence of MTA employees and NYPD. It could make some people feel very safe. Other people might say, hey, what are all these NYPD doing here? What's going on? Is something wrong? Um, media reporting, maybe what your friends are talking about. These are all things that, that go into the perception of safety. Um, and we also, I just want to mention, um, every quarter we do a customer satisfaction survey and the Q1 survey just came out. It's gonna be talked about a lot at our upcoming board. Um, but one of the, the biggest concern for both active customers, active riders and people who are uh, maybe not riding right now um, is actually crime and harassment. So, and Andrew was alluding to this at the beginning, in some ways that's positive that we maybe we're turning a corner on coronavirus because that's not people's number one concern anymore. Um, but also, if that's what people are concerned about, that's what we also care about a lot. 
Right. So um, whose responsibility is it? Who is doing the policing of the subways and buses? Well, within uh, Community Board 7, all policing matters um, are really within the jurisdiction of the New York Police Department. So um, in particular, their Transit Bureau, also known as Transit Police, are responsible for the subways. And they are made up of 12 geographic districts and they also have a number of specialized units um, and task force for on terrorism, vandalism, uh, MetroCard fraud. So they're policing the subways. And in terms of buses, those are policed by the Patrol Service Bureau, which is the same as that's precinct police. Um, it was not always like that. Uh, transit police used to work for the MTA and they um, actually merged and became NYPD forces in 1995. And um, I'm sure you could guess who the mayor was then, or you might know, but it was Giuliani. And could you guess who the MTA chairman was? Probably not. It's, wait, anyone can take a guess? Ross Sandler? Oh, no, no. I'm thinking. He was an MTA chair. DOT, yeah. Peter um, Stengel. Anyway, um, so that. Andrew, I thought you would know. I'm very surprised. I remember Peter Stengel from Metro North, uh, but that's way long ago. <laughs> it was a long time ago, and he had yeah. a four year tenure. Um, I, I definitely didn't know that. I had to look it up. So um, that merger took place in 1995 and um, MTA did retain a small, a very small by comparison police force and they police Metro North, Long Island Railroad and Staten Island Rail and uh, Metro North and Long Island Railroad, you know, that could not fall to anyone else because they travel through so many jurisdictions whereas subways and buses are all within the city jurisdiction Staten Island is its own special case in that um, it was not, they had their own police forces. They were never transit police. They had their own Staten Island police force and they only merged into MTAPD in uh, 2005, but not super relevant to CB7. So uh, policing within CB7 falls to the NYPD. Um, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go slightly out of order. So I just wanted to say on that, that specifically for um, CB7, geographically, you're within two of NYPD's transit bureau districts, district three to the north and district one uh, to the south. Um, and as I mentioned, they have, there's district folks and then there's special task force folks. Within the districts, there are neighborhood coordination officers. So in their words, these are your local problem solvers. These are your local experts. They spend their entire tours within your district, visiting the same locations um, and within the same sectors. And you can contact them. They make it really easy on the, um, on the city website to look up specifically by station who your NCOs are and they're your best local experts on, on policing matters. Um, so a small update on, um, on policing, really this year um, in February, I'm sure you all read about these horrific violent attacks that occurred from the evening of February 12th through the, the 13th. Um, these attacks on homeless people and two people were murdered. Um, immediately following that, the NYPD reassigned, and Commissioner Albert also mentioned this, 644 officers to the Transit Bureau, um, which we thought was a really important step and really much needed. We are asking still on top of that for the city and Commissioner Shea to reassign a thousand additional officers this would bring staffing levels for transit place up to 95 where they were when that, that merger um, took place. Se separate from policing issues, we also know that there are um, interrelated issues with mental health 
And so we're also asking the city for appropriate mental health resources and to expand 311 into the transit system. Um, Sorry, can I just ask a quick question, yes. clarifying question? When you say they asked, they reassigned 644 officers in February, how many were there before? I, 644 additional, right? Yes, so reassigned. And the number, I'd have to confirm it, I think was about two, it was 2000, I, I wouldn't want to misstate the number. But there were a lot. It was between 2000 and 3000. Yeah. It's definitely within there, but I don't know the exact number. Thanks. Um, if you see something, want to mention what you can do, call 911. If you see something unsafe, use one of our help point intercoms. Um, here's one being com cleaned, combining uh, with the topic I last presented on. Um, and those have two buttons, one where you will be put in touch with the station booth and one for emergencies that goes to our RCC, which is um, staffed with fire department and police department um, employees, as well as our own. Um, or you can find a police officer or MTA employee um, and they will be able to help you. And if you find, but they are different. If you find an MTA employee, they, they may go find a police officer or report it, but they can certainly help you um, figure out what the right help is needed for that situation. And we're continuing to work with City Do It to expand 311 service. Um, which is for non-police forces, but to help get other agencies uh, to respond within our system when issues come up, which isn't currently possible now because it's a address-based system and our uh, subway stations don't have addresses like above ground. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about a little bit was the crime data. So this is, NYPD data, um, they report on crimes. We get it at the MTA um, regularly and it's reported publicly at our monthly board meetings. And um, if you go on our website, you can see those reports within, because we're talking about subways and buses within the transit and bus committee books, which are on our website and they're reported on a, a monthly basis and they compare different years. So for next month, it will look at January through March data for 2020 and compare it, sorry, 2021 and compare it to 2020. And at the end of the year, you could see the, the full year. NYPD also reports data on their website. And that data is actually a bit more nuanced. So the stuff that gets reported to the MTA is system wide. But if you are looking on the city website, uh, at NYPD data, you can also get it by transit bureau district. Now there's, you guys have a lot of district one, maybe only a small part of district three. So, you know, it's still not, it's not by community board, but it's more, um, you get more geographically split up. What are the trends right now? Uh, crime, most felonies are down, but uh, it's not commensurate with how much our ridership is down. Um, so that is what's concerning. And in 2021, we are actually seeing crime down even more than it was in 2022, but we had these particularly horrible uh, murders in February. So for, for murders, that rate is already higher than it was, was last year. But um, Leah, we haven't had 2022 yet. Did I, am I saying like all the wrong years? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> For, Just once. That's what I meant. <laughs> um, so this information is available online, um, and I want to stop there and see uh, see what questions there are. Okay, folks. Um, any particular? Um, by the way, when Leah spoke about how many police uh, were in the system prior to the additional six hundred and forty four. Let's not forget 472 stations, thousands of bear control areas and thousands of platforms we're talking about. So it may sound like a lot, but it really isn't. And we need people to not only be safe, but to feel safe. 
So um, to that, end, and ridership is going up, and that usually means um, less bad things happen when there's more people around. So that's that's a very encouraging sign as well. Last week, we had the highest ridership since the beginning of the pandemic, over 2 million in the subways, which is great news. But please, questions. Yeah, I put my hand up. Oh, go ahead, Ken. But Christian had his hand up too. So. Well, we see you and hear I, you I, now. So we yeah, will take yeah, Christian go, next. Go, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Lee, I was just... I didn't see on your list of what makes people feel safe uh, is other people. And uh, to me, that has always been what makes me feel safe or uncomfortable on the subway. If I get into an empty car, um, depending on where I am, I'm terrified. Um, so uh, I think it's we're, we're just playing this chicken and egg process right now that um, we need people to come back. Um, and uh, they're, when they're not coming back, they're feeling less safe because there are fewer people around, the ones who are coming back. Um, so it's, I think it's gonna be a slow process, but would these um, additional officers be a permanent fixture, do you think, once they were there? So also that was an excellent point and so true people being there really do does make it safer so not just feel safer but it actually does make it safer and it's a bit of a catch-22 um and in terms of will they be permanent that is a decision for the city um and it's not actually something that that we control we certainly hope that they are permanent and we hope that it increases okay Christian. If you want a little, yeah, Andrew, if you want a little bit of help, there is uh, Christian and then Sarah has her hand up. So that could be the order. Also, sure. also can, can you stop the sharing screen if uh, we're not going to be showing any more slides? Okay. So uh, I, I started uh, using the subway for the first time this week again. And the one thing that made me feel unsafe is the homeless people on the subway. Unsafe from a, a health perspective and unsafe from a security perspective. And I, I was traveling, I mean, it was like uh, before seven o'clock in the morning. And you get one homeless person comes in and lays down on one of the, on one of the uh, seats. <laughs> I mean, uh, on, on the one train, you go to the other train, there's already homeless people on the cars, just traveling back and forth. And, uh, and, and, I just think that the system can do something better than that. And it just made me wish to like, I could have, that I, had, I wish I had a car so I could drive in. <laughs> I mean. Are we, Leah, do you, you want to take that, Leah? Yeah. Sure. Th thank you for riding. And I'm sorry, you know, that it wasn't an experience that made you feel safe. You know, we recognize that that is something that makes people feel unsafe, whether it's a, a actually a crime or actually a safety issue. And, um, you know, we work really closely with the city. Um, they are the ones who provide uh, mental health and homeless outreach within the subway system. Um, and so it's, those are the resources that we rely on. Um, and, but we do know how important it is to our customers. Um, also, if uh, you're riding the train and you perceive a, a, a dangerous situation, or let's say uh, somebody's harassing passengers, what is the best, the, the best first step to take in that case? I can't answer that as a non uh, safety. I mean, I mean, in terms of reporting, you know, in terms of reporting, what would be the best first step? So if you're, you're on a moving vehicle. Right. Okay, so some things that when you're reporting it are important are within the train car, there's a number on the train car. So write down that number if you can, or you can take a picture of it. Information that's gonna be useful in reporting is what's the train line, what direction, what's the time. So you're on a moving train, but you know, okay, I was at 72nd Street and it was 1015, I was in train car this on the three line. Right. That's going to be, and then description of what you saw, details of who the offending person was. So if you have all that information, that is, is super useful. And um, you can report it via help points. 
um, you can report it to a booth agent. And depending on what it was, you can also call, definitely, definitely call 911. Or if you see a police officer, uh, tell them. And Christian, I've reported any number of homeless individuals who were actually in danger themselves, but also a danger to others. It's not healthy to live in the subway system and inhale rail dust 24 seven, well, 22 seven now uh, until the 24 hour service <laughs> resumes. But we should be able to take care of our homeless population. This is a city problem. It's not an MTA problem. It just has translated into a, an MTA problem. One of the advantages of, of the earlier shutdown was that it caused maybe 10% of the homeless to actually seek and get some help. But we have to do a much better job. The, the, the uh, third party organization that the MTA uses, the Bowery Residence Committee, um, is doing is going all over the system, but many folks have said it's not enough and they need more done and the city needs to do more. There's no question about it. I think Christian understated the case. It's more than just a safety issue. <laughs> this discourage seeing that, whether it's safe or not, is a, is a discouragement to people to use mass transit. Oh, absolutely. And unfortunately, in some cases, and I reported this last Saturday at a station in Brooklyn, some of the homeless actually defecate in places. And I had to report this and have it cleaned up. Fortunately, it was done within an hour, but um, this is not healthy for anybody, in particular, the homeless. Uh, so we really need to, to, to get our, maybe, maybe it's a mayoral issue for the mayoral campaign, but we need to get this problem taken care of and these people help. They need it and everybody needs to return to the system for the help, for the economic health of New York. Um, all right, after having, Having done that, we have Sarah and then Jay. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Leah. That was really informative um, and I really appreciate that presentation. Um, I'll just say first, I have been riding since about last June. I took about two months or three months off um, and I have always felt incredibly safe on the subways and buses. So, um, you know, I, I do think part of it is a perception problem and I, I think it's important that we have these conversations and that we talk about it, but I think it's also important that we, you know, also say that it is actually for the most part safe and we do want more people to ride. So like, let's, I don't wanna to contribute to the problem by talking about it, but obviously um, we want it to be safe. I was wondering to that point, because it's so much a perception thing. I have a couple of questions, so I'll just say them all and then you can answer. Um, if the MTA has considered doing some kind of ad campaign about it, um, I, I saw someone on Twitter say like, it would be great to have an ad campaign of like, you know, people in suits are like high fashion people like riding the train so that it's like, come back, you know, we're all on the train. Um, so, or maybe Andrew said that actually last time. I can't remember who said it, but I think it's a great idea. So um, I was wondering about that. And then, you know, we kind of touched on it, the 24 hour service. I was just wondering because, um, you know, I, I do think that that is important um, to get back to that. And then this is, this is really fascinating to me about the, uh, MTA PD versus the NYPD. And I'm just saying, you know, I'm looking at who uses the MTA PD, the Metro North, Long Island Railroad and Staten Island Railroad, which seem to have very little crime and be very safe. And I'm wondering if there's any conversation about changing back to, to having an MTA PD on the subways. Thank you for being such a consistent rider. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's been a largely um, positive experience for you. Um, and in terms of ad campaigns, love that suggestion and we'll definitely share it back. We are gonna be doing different things as we welcome more and more riders back to the, the system. Um, and as more and more parts of New York open. Um, so we love that and I think it's a great idea. Um, and on, I, I haven't heard any discussions about uh, the MTA uh, having their own police force or taking, well, we have our own police force of bringing subway and um, bus policing back to be internal. And I don't, I don't know if Commissioner Albert, if you've heard that being discussed, I think it has a, I there's a reason done. why they did it, but. <laughs> Uh, we, we need extra, we need more police. And um, I think we're a little agnostic on wh what department they come from. Um, but I think it's essential to make people feel safe and be safe and protect our workers as well and get the, and you know, 
and, and make sure that the Bowery Residence Committee knows that it, what it needs to do and, and get them working on it. So I, I think if a police officer, um, you know, if many police officers who are patrolling different parts of the system all have the same experience with, with increasing homeless, for instance, in a particular place, and one police officer told me about it, a particular place, um, then I think the Bowery Residence Committee could send extra folks to that area and see what they could do to get those people help because right now they're not getting it. Yeah, I just think it would, I, I'm wondering if it's like a political problem or what, why that there is that difurcation of, you know, the, the MTA police versus the NYPD. Um, MTA police are on the Long Island Railroad and Metro North principally because they go through suburban counties and then come into the city. Um, the, yeah. N, the, you know, the NYPD. But it seems like they do a good job, so, right? Well, it's, <laughs> a, different, it's a totally different environment too. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, nobody's going to sleep on a Long Island Railroad platform when it's 10 degrees out. So right, right. hopefully. <laughs> yes. And but I agree with you, Andrew, that the, the homelessness issue is a much more fundamental problem that the city needs to address. Yes, indeed. For sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think Jay was next. Uh, yeah, my question uh, to Andrew and, and Leah, um, I, I, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, that we have security cameras on the stations, uh, but am I correct that we don't have them in the train cars? Is that correct? Yes. It has, over the years, has thought been given to install cameras uh, in the cars? Absolutely, it has. And um, some of the new car equipment um, is, is camera ready, let's put it that way. And I believe there are extra, um, I think uh, Sarah Feinberg said recently at a meeting that um, she is advocating for and we are getting more cameras installed all over the place. These won't be the high tech ones, they will just be cameras that will record an incident and can be referred to at a later time if there is an incident. Would, would part of that be something that where someone could connect with the conductor or the engineer in case of an emergency? You mean with the camera? Well, you know, certainly these days with technology, cameras and sound uh, are totally integrated. Uh, I, I'm sure any new equipment the current equipment would include both. No, the new the new cameras actually are sort of a lower tech. They're just recording uh, mm -hmm. pictures. They don't have the high tech capability that some of the in station cameras um, have. Uh, but I will ask that question, Jay. Yeah, I mean, it certainly uh, would partially at least alleviate people's concerns when uh, when they're and and this way Ken wouldn't have to be scared to death if he walked into an empty car, if he knew a camera at least was on. That's, it's really ironic because many folks say they, they purposely go to an empty car because they fear it's more COVID free. <laughs> yeah. Takes all kinds. Yes, yes. Okay, um, next, uh, Ken, do you have another question? Yes, I do. If can I, can... I take William before please. I take you since you've had please. a question already? Please do. All right, William. Cool. Uh, thank you, Andrew, and um, thank you, Leah, for your presentation. Um, safety is a big issue in New York City, um, and obviously the subway system is an important part of New York City's success. Um, like Christian and many others, I, I take the train every day, uh, pretty much, to work, and I've been riding since last June as well. Um, and I can take many trains to work. I can take the 1, the BD, the NRW, um, and actually the, the BD and the NRW is the most convenient train for me. But I stay on the one train, and even though it's a 10 minute walk for one specific reason, is because that train line gives me the opportunity to move between carts. The other carts, you're sitting ducks, and they're locked in. And if you're in a bad situation and train stall between stations, it's uncomfortable. I remember one night I was coming home um, from work, and there was, a, there was a person there who was smoking on the train in the actual cart, and I have asthma, and I had to quadruple mask up if that was even a thing, if it was possible. Uh, and I wish I had the ability to leave that situation, to move over. And I know running between, not running, but moving between carts 
is unsafe. But I, I think that we should give riders the ability or the option to get themselves out of situ, uh, sticky situations. So my question is, has the MTA considered unlocking some of these cars to give riders an opportunity to move from uh, a bad situation? Thank you. And I think a lot of people could would definitely share that sentiment that, you know, when you feel unsafe, you want to be able to get out of that car, go to a different car. Um, certainly riding on a local train gives you more oppor opportunities to do that. So um, I don't have a lot of details about it, but we are looking at open, um, but moving between cars is not always safe. Right. Um, and that's why you're not allowed to do it. But we are looking at, um, I think, is it called open gangway? Like cars that, like yeah. an articulated bus, they're like the sections are open to each other and you can just freely move between them. They have them in other countries. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Andrew. Yeah, the, uh, the, the order for R211 subway cars, um, which are going to replace um, some of the older cars with one which I happen to love, conversational seating, but the R211s, uh, uh, a sample, few uh, trains worth of those will have open gangways, which will allow, the, the idea is to allow faster boarding and people to move in further, um, but there will be openings. It will be totally open from one end of the train to the other, which they do have in other places. And uh, we will see how, how that works. Um, I know the It's Showtime crowd is gonna love those because they can bring their show from one end of the train to the other without having to get out on a platform and move. Um, but uh, we will see if, if that's safe and if, if the climatic conditions uh, remain uh, fine for heating and air conditioning and everything. But um, um, the, the uh, R62As, which are on the, on the one line, um, uh, obviously they're an older car and they do, um, they, they always were open because on the IRT lines, which the one is part of, um, the tunnels are narrower and some of the curves are sharper and they couldn't do those very long cars, which we do lock the and so, so that's one of the reasons, um, William, that you have open cars on the one, but who knows? We, we don't have a, a, a new IRT car order on uh, yet. So we will see what kind of a car uh, and circulation they, those will have when they finally replace the R62s, the R62As, but it will be interesting. Okay, Ken, you were next. Yeah, um, I wanted to raise a, an above ground issue. Um, that relates to the Transit Bureau. Um, at, um, and I'm afraid it's gonna get worse with a thousand more uh, potentially uh, officers into the system. Um, at Columbus Circle, um, there's a Transit Bureau headquarters, I think, uh, uh, yeah. is it, what is it, District 1? Yep. It's headquartered there. And um, there we've have a, we have a chronic problem of um, officers uh, parking in the bike lane. Um, that goes around the periphery of Columbus Circle. And I've actually never ridden by there on my bike without having to go out into traffic um, and go around. Usually uh, it looks like a private car, but it has a placard on it. Um, and uh, it's not just one car, it's from four or five. So um, is that anything that can, somebody can work on? You should definitely work with District 1 um, about that and and see if they can instruct their officers not to bark in the bike lane. Yeah, can you know, um, when we had the former administration in office, um, I, I checked with District 1 and there were some other than District 1, there were other police uh, vehicles there because there was there were frequently protests in front of the Trump uh, International Hotel there and that caused an awful lot of police uh, police cars to be in that area. It should have dissipated now, I'm guessing. Yeah, th this is separate from that. This is just parking in the bike lane because it's right next to the curb. It's been going on ever since that bike lane opened. Um, I, so. I know who to talk to about that. I will continue that discussion. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Andrew, I, I do have some questions yeah, Steve, to wait to the end. Um, Please go ahead, Steve, you're on. Okay. Just a couple quick ones and then a, a more elaborate one. You, you ran some numbers. Could you just clarify? So how many, you, you said you, you asked for 600, but, and if you don't know these answers, you can certainly follow up, but how many are, how many officers are patrolling the MTA now? I mean, in total, what is that number? 
So um, I can't give you the exact number that would have to really come from the Transit Bureau um, because they also have, uh, yes. So I was looking at some articles um, in response to, this was Sarah's question. So prior to Commissioner Shea's increase of about 644 uh, officers, the number was at about, I believe, 2,400. Um, and I would, but because not all those officers um, maybe were permanently assigned, I wouldn't want to give, okay, well, okay. I don't think it's A plus B equals C you know, they would be best to give you that number. But that's where we were at about 2,400 prior to that. Um, and we're still looking for additional officers to be assigned to bring us up to those 95 levels. Can I ask like, like what was that number 2019 or 2018? I'm just curious what it was two or three years ago. Yeah, like what's the, the historic, has it been growing? Yeah. I mean, is it I don't drastically have... down relatively? Yeah. That's what it's been. I mean, I'm just curious, you know, like you said, uh, perception is reality or reality is perception, whatever you want to say, but I'm just curious if we've got more or less. I mean, I would think because of challenges that we've had, it would be less, but I'm just curious to what degree it is. Unfortunately, I don't have that information handy, um, but we can reach out to our colleagues at the Transit um, Bureau and see if I can get you some of that information or where it might be. I'd be interested in seeing the historical trends, you know, of, of where it's been and to an extent, you know, is there a direct correlation between we're down 50% and, you know, what things could or couldn't happen again. Just, just, I'd be curious of that if you could follow up. And then my next question is just, just like broader, I mean, to, and there may be nothing, but to what extent can we do preventive things, right? I mean, uh, it, a lot of the things that you talk, call 311 or if this happened, report it, but you know, are, are there things that can be done preventive? Well, a, a preventive for these issues, whether, you know, whether they are mental health sweeps, because I think some of the more serious things can be mental health issues. I'm just too curious to what extent that, again, I think I'm, I'll say it again in, a, in, a, in the way that it is, which is, you know, how can there be a proactive, you know, preventive way as opposed to reactionary, which, which I think is the traditional way, but I'm just curious, are there things that can be done, particularly around mental health? Yeah, it's a great question. And, um, you know, we would really defer to the experts on mental health and policing. You know, we are running the trains and that is our area of expertise. But what, what works historically to prevent crime, to drive those statistics down, to get people um, the help that they need and not having to live in a system where it's not safe for them, it's really, these are, um, these are city issues that the, those with expertise in these areas can best answer. Okay, then I think I know sort of the next answer, but I thought I'd just answer, and that is, does the MTA think you have enough police to bar, police policing for to to keep it safe do you have a position on that does the mta believe that there is enough officers in the system no we would like a thousand more officers in the system thank you and Great. steve just a quick follow-up there are certain there are quite a few things that the riders can do to keep themselves safe um don't stand near the edge uh know who's around you um know where the nearest exit is and uh Things like that. Um, I think most, most folks are safe and will be safe. And I think as ridership builds, that will make things even safer. But there are some common sense things as well. Agreed. And, and between to personalize it, my son takes the, you know, when he goes to school, he takes the, the MTA. And I, every day, give him a small two, small two thing, look around, keep an eye, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are issues. But Which I, is I what, you, what you do in the street, too. You make sure you know who's around you. I do think recently I've been a little more concerned, but I understand your point. And, and I do appreciate, Leah, your point about wanting a thousand more, a um, thousand more. I think that's, that's interesting to know, and I'm glad that you shared it with us. Great. That was, those are my questions. Um, well, um, I think that's probably it. So thank you again, Leah, uh, for being here and uh, taking on a difficult subject and hope you, you stay safe.
and I hope everybody uh, returns to the system because I've been riding frequently and I'm seeing ever increasing numbers of riders and the service has been really good. Um, thank so, so thank you for that. Yes, and we hit 2 million riders last week, which is great. So hopefully yep. that's gonna help us increasing safety. Thank you so much for having me and for all your wonderful questions. We, we didn't have again, any Leah. community questions. I didn't see any. Okay. I can ask, a, there is a Q&A, so if you want to ask the timing, there is a, a, a attendee that sort of brought on your last one that says, does the MTA have an alternative idea or plan to add, that can add the 1,000 cops, whether it be social workers or not? There's, I mean, again, that's the question, if you have an answer for it. So basically, since, since 95, the policing has been the responsibility of the NYPD. And, and to Sarah's question, well, why couldn't we bring it? back to MTA, it really becomes a question of, of resourcing. So are we gonna take money from running trains to hire police and social workers and run less trains? Are we gonna find more money somehow? Those, I mean, that's, we couldn't just uh, suddenly start doing those, those things. So it really is currently the jurisdiction of the city and that's where we're looking for the resources to come from. Okay. You need more money generally. <laughs> so does everyone. I just wanted to point out that walking versus going in a private car versus mass transit, the safest of the three is mass transit, just statistically. It may not and, be uh, but it is. I, I, yes, and because so many of today's, of this evening's topics have centered on the homeless, I'm going to see if I can get somebody from BRC to come and speak to us. I think that would be really, really terrific uh, for another meeting. Great. Uh, thank you again, Leah. Thanks. Thanks, Have a good Leah. Bye. Bye. Up to you, Howard. <laughs> well, our next topic is actually Ken's um, Ken's topic, and it's it's a I think I think it's a great one. Let my people go. Um, it's it's very aptly named. Uh, you're on. Okay, um, this this um, is an example of I think of how we as a society take s some of our essential workers for granted and unintentionally treat them as something less than human. We're completely ignoring whether or not uh, our delivery workers have a place to perform an essential human function, and the fact is that they don't. In some cases, the very restaurants that these delivery workers used to work for and now longer, no longer do because they work for third party app companies, the restaurants are now denying them bathroom access. And I, ironically, these delivery workers are often what's been keeping these restaurants in business for the last year. And this is a wide, widespread problem. If you talk to delivery workers, it's one of the main things that they bring up. Um, uh, is their lack of bathroom access um, because they work for the third party apps. And uh, even the restaurants that they once worked for will not allow them in. Um, and they're risking their lives for us, literally, so that we don't have to over the past year. So we can order in without having to go to a store or to a restaurant. And I think they deserve better. Um, I think we need to start treating them as if their lives and their working conditions matter. And I think bathroom access is as good a place as any to start. Uh, we have a couple of hands, Ken. Um, I Linda. Think, I think it's appropriate one that the BCI co-chair should have had, should have seen your, um, your suggested resolution. That's number one. And not at the end, at the last minute, I just happened to have it slip by me. I think BCI, if you're going to call a joint meeting, should have been invited. I think the premise of what you're saying, although it, it, it's, there, there are some great ideas, these are not staff members, you're, you're assuming they're staff members or they were staff members of restaurants. No. Viabilities so issue, you just said it. You just said they were former members. No, some of them were, some of them were, you not all of them. By, means, by no I means all of them. I can tell you they probably aren't. But that's, that's not the issue. The issue is, the end of what you were suggesting is to go after the SLA, after the liquor license of restaurants that don't comply. Now, let me just say a few things. And, and I did, we have a friendly amendment 
that really kind of outlines all of the positions, the restaurants, the businesses, because we represent small businesses as well as the community. And it also, it also addresses the issues. First and foremost, we live in one of the few cities in the world that doesn't have public facilities, and that's crazy. And that's really where this conversation should be directed. Most of the restaurants, especially in this neighborhood, because we don't have the Olive Gardens, and they, have, they don't have the multi-stall units. They have one or two bathrooms at the most, and they're to serve their, their patrons. And you're not considering that. And their patrons in this neighborhood happen to be overwhelmingly senior, senior citizens. We have a large portion of senior citizens who have to use those facilities, as well as their staff members. And you're not considering that. And, and so there's so many issues here that you're just kind of conflating everything and making it a simple, oh, the bad restaurants aren't letting them in. Let's also talk about the third party. They are, they are independent contractors of third party delivery groups. And, and those third party delivery groups should be responsible. And perhaps, and I'm suggesting, uh, um, and this is up for discussion, and, but I'm suggesting the possibility that, that they reimburse or that they pay, or there's a fund from, uh, funded by the caviars, the seamlesses, so that the restaurants, which will have to have extra staff, extra hours, extra labor to clean the extra usage in their one or two lavatories will at least have the ability to, to pay their staff because that's going to be important. So there's so many issues. And to sit here and say, oh, the big bad restaurants aren't giving them access. It's not that simple, Ken. If, if you look at it from the perspective of the patrons, and I'm a patron of restaurants, even through COVID, I was sitting outside in the cold. Um, and and the, the fellow workers, the staff members who also use those one or two bathrooms, it, it's, we don't want to be cruel. We want to, we want to get the city to provide facilities, not just for the, the, bike, the bike delivery guys, but all the delivery people, all the people who are working in this city. They deserve access. People walking around deserve access to public facilities. That's the beginning of the, uh, the discussion. But if we want, but that's going to take time. So, but if we want, if we want to provide services, I think it should be up to the restaurants that have the facilities, that have the staff and give them an opportunity to volunteer and then reimburse them for the extra costs that are, that are going to be, that, are, uh, that they're going to face in cleaning them, especially with the COVID protocols. Thanks, so Linda. So well, I'm gonna say one more thing. Uh, Kurt yeah. and I will bring this up. Uh, we did I, we did provide a, a whereas, but at the end of the day, and we spoke to um, Stephen too, we think this should be tabled. This should be a bigger discussion. We would like to invite all of the stakeholders, the restaurateurs, the uh, delivery service guys. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of questions that have to be asked. Certainly the seamless and the, and, and the, and the, the delivery services who, who don't hire, who use these independent contractors. And let's get that discussion going before we make a decision to try and penalize, to, pro to propose these punitive re measures on restaurants and small businesses that are just starting to get their feet back on the ground. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Andrew, Riggi, I, I know you have a time issue, so please Thank go Thank you. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. I just lost you, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. No. Oh, yes. So, you know, we've been. I lost you again. Um, I'm going to try to. How about now still? We can, I hear we you can now. hear you now and then it's buzzing out after a couple words. So whatever you did for the first three words, keep it for the fourth and fifth <laughs> word because <laughs> we can hear you in the beginning. Oh, gosh. Yeah, but we're, we're, we're not hearing you now. Andrew, my suggestion is, per, yeah. Why don't Wait, you, he just uh, left. He's going to come back. You come no. back to him and you go on. Maybe you have Barbara and then go back to Andrew. Yeah, Barbara, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I was horrified when I read this resolution. I don't know who drafted this, but first of all, it, it it's horrifying on all levels. I do not think that this board should be voting on this resolution. It oh, is, is this any better? It, it's poorly. Oh, that's very good. 
Can, we'll take okay. you one sec, Andrew. I can, oh. I can continue later if you like. If you want to take Andrew, that's fine. Yeah, we're in agreement, Barbara. What? Thank, Go ahead, thanks. Andrew. I, I, I'm so sorry. You can hear me now. I mean, it's just a bad Very good. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, yeah. So, you know, through my work, I've been deeply involved in this issue uh, with some of the organizations even that are representing the delivery people. We had sent out an industry-wide memo saying, of course, these are essential workers. You need to do everything you can to, you know, accommodate them always, but especially, you know, during, uh, you know, the past year, which has been so trying. Um, I would just say a few things. One, I do not think we should have any resolution at this time. Being involved in this issue, it is quite complicated. I do not think it should be any way tied to a liquor license where there is no relationship between that and the liquor license. And in fact, a lot of the businesses that do a very high volume of delivery work do not even have a liquor license and they may be small, so they wouldn't even be covered by this. Um, but there are operational uh, you know, things that need to be considered. Um, there are legal issues to be considered. It also opens up a big thing because they are not direct employees. What's the difference between them and other people that work for other companies? Um, so I would just say that I think there's a lot that needs to be explored, discussed. I think we absolutely, from a just good community standpoint, should engage local restaurant tours to ask them what they are doing, why, if they prohibit using the restroom, why do they do that? And I would just urge, uh, you know, the committee and the board, you know, to table this for now. Let's have a more in-depth conversation and try to address it. And the last thing I'd say, which is a little bit more 10,000 feet, but Linda hinted at it, is you know, our city needs to have public facilities, not just for delivery workers, but for everyone that uses the public space. And I think it's problematic to try to solve part of this issue on local restaurants, especially talking about the issue during a pandemic, having different people going in and out of the restaurant, having to meet all the requirements for temperature and contact tracing, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. So I'm so sorry. Yeah. There's a lot of different requirements there. There's legal issues. So it's incredibly important. They're essential workers. We need to find ways to accommodate them. Liquor license connection, I don't think is appropriate. Part of a larger conversation. I'm so sorry I had to jump out of a dinner meeting that I'm in, but just wanted to Thank you, share Andrew. my thoughts. And uh, I appreciate very much. it. Happy to follow up in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. You Thank got you, it. Andrew. Bye, everyone. Okay. Um, Josh, Josh Cohn. Can I just finish? Yeah, Barbara, 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 you got to go back to Barbara. You got to go back to Barbara. She, she kindly yeah. acquiesced back okay, to you. Well, I will always defer Andrew, to Barbara. So there you Andrew go. basically said it all, but I just feel that this resolution, there, I don't think there's a person on this board who, who or, or in the community who doesn't think it's just human decency to let somebody use your bathroom if they have to, if they're working for you. I, it's just incredible. But first of all, it's well, Andrew really just said it all, but I and I, I won't reiterate, but I would I would never vote on a resolution like this. I think it's terribly embarrassing to community board seven. This is nothing that nothing that we ever want to get out there and and have our name attached to. It's just awful. Sorry, thank you. Okay, uh, Josh. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Okay. So the first thing I wanted to say is that. I find it sad, mostly, that I didn't even find out about this until today. I wish that the Transportation Committee could have made this uh, invite to the BCI a little earlier, and maybe they had, but if they did, I was not a part of that communication. So that just, that makes me sad that we weren't included in that. And that that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing, as a business uh, owner in this, in this board, in this, in this district, whatever we want to call it, um, we, we've never had an issue of letting people in to use the facilities. And I'd like to see, or at least hear from businesses that have this issue. I think this is a much, much larger discussion. I want to hear people from Uber Eats. I want to hear people from Grubhub, from Slice, from wherever it might be. But to vote on this now seems to me to be crazy without any kind of evidence that this is even an issue, just because anybody brings an issue up without, in my, my opinion, any real concrete evidence seems extremely premature. 
Um, and so I just feel like that to even consider this to put something on on the liquor license, which affects the businesses that we're struggling like crazy just to tread water at this time seems completely uh, nuts. I mean, that's that's really what it boils down to. Basically, what what the last three speakers have said is we need to hear from the experts before we and then concoct a resolution. Basically. Can I propose a, a friendly amendment, a potential friendly amendment, and that would be to remove the last paragraph and have a mere request? No. To rest. Wait, no, can I finish? Absolutely not. Let no, finish. Way. no way. Finish? No way. No. I just want to say that my... Howard, you guys should stay in your own lane because it is a BCI issue, really? not a transportation issue. And if you want to do that, let us take the lead so that we can bring in the stakeholders and you're invited to participate. Uh, well, my comments are directed at Ken. If you would consider it as a friendly amendment, you're f everyone's free to vote it down. I'm just questioning whether he would consider that as a friendly amendment to make it more palatable. It's up to him. I don't understand your friendly amendment. Uh, removing the last paragraph so that it's a mere request to restaurant owners act reasonably and, and allow these delivery people to use the restrooms. That's, well, that's let, my question. But who, who, question. Says, I'm asking who a question. says they're not allowed? Who says they're not allowed? Right. Hey, Who's if, saying this? Um, you give me one person. I'm not, wait. Three or four people you've spoken to, Ken? You, there, I, there are you many. Can't force, you can't force a restaurateur to let someone use the bathroom I, if I they're think absolutely this, opposed to this it. This illustrates. The whole thing is asinine. I think what this discussion is, and everybody's frustration illustrates is, we should have asked uh, BCI to join this earlier. We should have um, had experts in the field, um, legal uh, restaurant association, you know, Andrew Ridgey from the Hospitality Alliance and others to talk about this and then possibly formulate a resolution rather than forming a resolution before we have any of the facts from yeah, experts. Why one of us saw this specious thing was because it was kind of, I, we, I saw Ken's, uh, but we weren't, wasn't, wasn't distributed to BCI. We didn't uh, as soon as I saw it, I sent it to you and Christian, Linda. We can, can, we, can, I, can we back up for a second? I asked Ken a question and no one's letting him answer it. Ken, but, would you consider that as a friendly amendment or, or not? Well, let me just explain why I wrote that about the SLA. Yeah, and, I'm curious. And not, not just the <laughs> SLA, but um, but outdoor cafe licenses also. I was just thinking- They're not licensed anymore, Ken. I was just thinking of whatever leverage we have as a community board. Uh, and, and we do this in the case of, let's say, uh, bike lights um, or, uh, or vests for restaurants. We, I know that BCI has wow. regularly asked okay. applicants, um, do you have bike lights for your uh, uh, delivery guys? And, and do you have vests and bells and such? And I believe you've been willing to withhold uh, approval if they don't. It's been a long time, Ken. I'm going to respond to that very quickly because most of them are using third party uh, delivery people. So yeah. that has especially been now, especially now. Okay. But I, I so was just, just looking, I was just looking for the kind of leverage, any kind of leverage we would leverage have. for what? But leverage for what? Le leverage for uh, persuading restaurants to allow delivery workers who deliver, who pick up from them, who are actually physically going into the restaurant and picking something up to allow them to use the restaurant. Well, don't, don't you think- I have my hand up. I mean, I, you I would think like, we were talking about a different kind of human being. No, we're, we're not. not. We're, we're, no, we're, we're not. We're not. We're not. We're not. situation. And it's not just those human beings. It's also the patrons. It's also the people who work for them. It's not a simple discussion. And all of us, nobody, nobody wants people having to, to void on the street. Nobody wants to see people in pain. We have this is there. This is multi layers of issues. And, and I think we up. also uh, want people to be able to wash their can hands. Can I speak? I have my hand delivering up. food. Yeah, we'll get to. I'm sorry, Roberta. This is um, I'm people sorry, are just calling I, out. Now. I could just help the chairs to get organized. Just saying, there are several people that there do still want to speak, and and I would just suggest that we go through it. And and Howard asked a question to Ken. Just it's his meeting, but to facilitate it, Ken, you could think about it. If you want no. to remove that or not, and we can defer, but there are a handful of more people that want to speak. And if I could just suggest to let them, that may be good from a process perspective. Agreed. 
Uh, Josh, have you spoken uh, or did you want to say something else? Well, the, the only thing that I would add, thank you, Andrew. The only thing that I would add is that one of the things that, it, that happens now with any kind of food service or anything now is that the public can let people know what's, what's good and bad about a, about a restaurant. So if right. restaurant X is not allowing people to use their facilities, you can bet it'll show up on Yelp or Google or something yeah. where people are going to say, uh, Joe's place on Amsterdam, I hope there's not a Joe's on Amsterdam, but Joe's place <laughs> on Amsterdam is not doing the right thing. That is so much more powerful than anything else right. these days because that really drives business. The, the, the fact that people are able to post these things, good or for bad, does affect businesses. And if businesses do the wrong thing, you can bet, and I'll say this from my own experience with our businesses, the public will let you know before it even ends. They're in that place with their phone. If you think that these, these delivery people don't have phones to say the same thing, they 100% will do that. It, there's no, you can do it anonymity. It doesn't even matter. So I think that the, the, this is the way, that's the way that, that, puts, that puts this out there that people aren't doing the right. I think most of the businesses are good actors. They're not, they're not stopping people from doing these things. And it's so few to, 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 to put something so egregious just seems to me crazy. I'll use that word again. It's just crazy. Okay, and that's all thanks. I Thank you, Andrew. Uh, okay. uh, Jay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll only take a minute. I agree wholeheartedly with Linda and Barbara and, and Josh. I, I think this whole discussion is premature. And if we're going to, if, if we're going to consider this issue uh, at all going forward, um, I think we need to give the stakeholders uh, in, in this issue an opportunity to be heard uh, this is an issue that's much more nuanced than it appears uh, on, on its face. And just for myself, for the record, if and when this issue comes back, and if it went, if and when it ever somehow formulates itself into a resolution, any reference to tying in a liquor license or any other uh, permit to operate these businesses is an absolute deal breaker for me. I will never vote for anything that puts that kind of undue and unnecessary pressure on these small business owners in this community. Okay, thanks. Roberta. Thank you. So I agree with Andrew and Linda and, and Josh and Jay and Barbara. I, I think it's, it's inappropriate for the community board to, to vote on this. I think it's I, I think at some point BCI may want to may want to look at the issue. There may be other pieces of it that belong there. Um, public bathrooms, for years, Clary Newell was was Miss Public Bathroom, asking yeah. for kiosks for public bathrooms. I, I think if you want to have a good resolution, uh, a resolution that to ask the city to start putting in public bathrooms, especially now when you know I can't imagine you're taking the subway to work, everything's closed. It's not like you could go into a restaurant and buy some food and use the facilities. You don't wanna go into a restaurant, you wanna be safe. So I think having public bath, having a resolution for a public bathroom is fine, but I, I, I think it's, it would be a horrible thing for the community board to vote on a resolution like this. Thanks, Roberta. Um, Doug Kleiman. Hi. Um, well, I do agree with a lot that has been said here. I think it is a nuanced issue. It's complicated. It's even more complicated right now with COVID. Um, I do want to say that I personally have empathy and sympathy for human beings, all human beings that need to use the facilities, but this is a very complicated issue. I don't think that we've heard from the stakeholders. I would specifically like to hear from restaurant owners from the third party delivery companies. I'd love to hear from the delivery workers themselves. If they are having a real issue, would like them to come. I'd like, to, whether it's written or in person, I, I, we really need to have a well-rounded approach to this. It, it is complicated. There's a lot of things that we haven't even thought about. There are restaurants and delivery, um, uh, restaurants that have less than 20 customers aren't even required to have a bathroom for the public. 
So those restaurants would have to be exempt because they're not even required to have, you know, I mean, there's a lot of issues and there's so many other delivery workers that deliver to and from restaurants, bakeries and produce and, you know, so do they have to use the restroom? Um, and then you have occupancy levels. Right now, we hope it'll change and it'll go to 100%. But if you have a small restaurant and they have X number of people that are allowed in at 50% and you have a lot of delivery workers that suddenly you're now over capacity. Um, and you may have just enough restrooms. You know, I, I'm, in, I'm very involved in this space. When a restaurant operator is planning their, uh, their restaurant, uh, it's working with an architect and all the legal requirements, you know, you, they try to put as many restrooms as possible for the customers and employees. But now you, if you add a lot more people to that, um, yeah. you're going to have more people waiting. You have safety issues. Anyway, it, I think it's complicated. I think we need to hear from the stakeholders. Um, absolutely. I think we need more public restrooms and public places. I would get behind a resolution like that because I think it's, it's good for everyone. It would be good for delivery workers. It would be good for the, so that's that's an issue that I would get behind, and that's yeah, the Health and Human Services Committee. <laughs> there you go. And, then, and one last thing, yes, I, I do think that tying this into the SLA or it's look, I, I forgive me, I don't think it was was, was malicious, but it, it's almost like extortion. And it's one thing doesn't have to do with the other. So if a restaurant operator is acting behaving poorly with regard to their state liquor authority license they were serving underage people, if they were serving people beyond the point of intoxication, if there are fights, if there are brawls, if there's noise complaints, then I think we should talk about the relevant topic of renewing a license or not. And same thing with a cafe. If they're bleeding out into the street and they're abusing it, then we that's germane. But I don't think one issue, we can't hold one issue on, uh, over another. So anyway, I, I, I would I'd be, I, I would really uh, not like to vote on this uh, tonight. I really would like a lot more discussion about this. We need to hear from more people before I could even. Um, thanks, Doug. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Sarah? Oh, thanks. Um, well, first of all, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who um, from BCI who's here and brought this perspective. Uh, it's, it's good to hear this is an issue I've been caring about for a long time. Um, so it's good to hear that other perspective. Um, I just want to say, you know, I think we absolutely need more public restrooms. It's something like the city as a whole really needs to do, but it does also take a really long time to implement. So it's absolutely a bigger picture issue we should focus on, but it's not going to happen anytime in the next like couple of years. Honestly, it just take, they take a long time to build. Um, you know, I think I hear that it's complicated and, and I think, um, I, I think it makes sense to wait. But you know, these delivery workers have been keeping these restaurants alive for the last year. I mean, especially, you don't think so, Linda? Uh, these delivery workers, I think, are kept alive by, by third party um, delivery services that uh, definitely abuse them, obviously, and, and also gouge the restaurants. It's not a simple issue. Well, no, I mean, I, well, I understand that, but if the restaurants couldn't deliver their food, during the pandemic, I don't know that they would have stayed open, you know, so Everybody it that to it way. way. But it, it's not our place. It's not our place to tell restaurateurs what they have to do in any respect. Well, I mean, we do tell them sometimes, you know, they have to follow health grades. Well, they have to have, you know, oh, we tell them they're they're them to com possibly compromise their health grades based on the pandemic. It's just not that simple an issue, Sarah. Um, let's let Sarah finish you. if we could. Yeah. I mean, I hear, I hear you that it's not simple. And that's what I just said. I, I, I'm glad to get your perspective that it's not simple, but I think like, I, and I don't, I mean, I, I can't speak for Ken, but I wouldn't be demonizing the restaurants. I don't think that that was what Ken was intending, but you know, each restaurant, it's a collective action problem, right? Like each restaurant, it doesn't hurt them to say you can't use our restroom, but for the delivery worker, when every single restaurant they worked with says you can't use our restroom, they're then stuck without a restroom. So we are meant to look at the big picture and the big picture is then you have a bunch of delivery workers who don't have a restroom to use. And each, each individual restaurant, you know, doesn't have to look at that big picture, but we do. So um, I, I, you know, I think, it sounds like it wouldn't be reasonable to vote tonight, but I do think that we, um, I think we need to take a really serious look at this. And if it needs to go to BCI, um, that makes sense. But I do think it's something we should comment on as a community board, because I do think it's a really serious human rights issue. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Rich. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I don't think I was sent this resolution. I haven't seen it. So I can't specifically comment on the resolution. 
Um, I do think that we should defer to Andrew Ridgey and not vote on this tonight. Um, I think we need to hear from restaurants, delivery cyclists, third party services, um, and any other stakeholders. I have a few basic questions that uh, I'm posing. I don't think we need to answer them right now, but one is for the restaurants that do have their own delivery people, do they allow them to use the restroom? So is this really just a matter of the third party services or is it for both? And as specifically for the third party services, do delivery cyclists for those third party services, are they serving multiple restaurants on every shift or are they usually assigned to one restaurant? And obviously if they're servicing multiple restaurants, it becomes that much more complicated of an issue. Uh, in my mind, I think the issue largely is with these third-party services, the Grubhub, Seamless, uh, Uber yeah, Eats. That's, that's the issue. It's not just this. It's uh, in many ways, they're not accountable. Uh, I've many times raised that you know, these delivery cyclists are forced to do impossible tasks. And um, according to an article in the New York Times that I'm going to post in chat, um, they often don't even make minimum wage. And these third-party services really just aren't accountable. Uh, and I really think we need to address that as a bigger issue. Uh, obviously, the need for public restrooms is clear. It's a much bigger issue than just delivery cyclists, uh, but it's also been an issue for decades, and it's going to take time to make it happen, if ever. Um, we need to look at the issue of delivery cyclists, um, and it really should be transportation, BCI, and HHS. A lot of them are undocumented. It's really a human life issue, um, and, and that needs to happen quickly. Uh, as far as the issue of bathrooms, it is a basic issue of humanity and we can't hold it in much longer. Uh, and especially not, in, we can't rely on public restrooms to be the, the solution for this. Uh, and even though we shouldn't vote tonight, we do need to get moving on this really soon. And whether it's BCI or anyone else leading it, it has to happen quickly. Thank you. Andrew, uh, Chris, I, just, I did want to tell, tell you, I know that Will texted me and has a little bit of a time issue. So if he, if he could go next, it would be ideal. I know there's other people that were- um, Sure. He did, you know, he said he well. wanted to get the attention. Cool. Uh, thank you guys. Um, you know, like, I feel like this resolution as, as all of our resolutions do their best to solve problems that New Yorkers face. But this is a very highly complicated issue, I think, I believe. During my time as a committee member on BCI, I, I really learned a lot as far as what are the challenges restaurants face and a lot of businesses in our community faces. And in, in my day and my experience, being in a environment of retail and having and letting, allowing customers to have access to bathrooms, it is a complicated situation. And some businesses have the capacity to support um, an influx of, of, of people who need to use the bathrooms and some don't. And a resolution that has a, a, a one-size-fits-all solution is not a really good one. Um, I think Andrew really said it best where we need a lot of the stakeholders involved to tell us what they need and see how we can support. But until then, I don't think that this is a good resolution. So uh, I just kind of wanted to share my points on that. And, and Thank you, Will. Thank you. Uh, um, Christian, is your hand up? Yes. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, there's no more I can add and uh, uh, Rich said some of what I wanted to say. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I know that uh, some time back, Rich brought this issue to the attention of several of us, definitely to the shares of the BCI, HHS and transportation. And, and Rich really was trying to see if we could bring this issue to the fore and we didn't really do anything yet. And I would like to thank Ken for bringing the issue to the fore now. You know, it, it, it is on our radar. It's, it's not uh, uh, what the resolution that as Ken wrote it, I, I, it's not sufficient for now, but the issue is, is in our radar now. And we certainly will now get together and, and do a better forum for this issue. And, uh, I, and Ken, uh, given what everybody has said, I hope that by now you will have come to the conclusion to uh, withdraw the resolution for now so that we can uh, uh, do a, a forum on this. Thank you. Can I, can I speak? Ken, yes, yes you're next. Oh, okay. Yeah, Christian, I, I'm a, a decent enough poker player that I know when I have a losing hand. <laughs> uh, um, and and I, I appreciate everybody's uh, perspective on this. Um, I would be willing to drop uh, what Howard was suggesting. I drop about the SLA. Um, my main 
uh, point here and my main um, goal was to uh, make, make this part of the conversation that BCI has with restaurants. Um, and I would feel like it was a victory if every time you had a restaurant come before you for whatever, and you and they, you said, do you have delivery people? And, and they did, then you would say, do you allow them to use the restroom? And, and if they don't, then maybe you could have a conversation about why not. Um, I would feel like I would have succeeded with this resolution if that were gonna happen. Um, but I also think it would be wonderful and the, the sooner the better, I think this is a no pun intended urgent issue um, <laughs> that, uh, that, we, that BCI convene uh, a meeting of all stakeholders you can get. Um, it's gonna be very difficult to get delivery people, but believe me, if you do a Google search, um, you're gonna find a lot of testimonials from delivery people uh, complaining about this very issue. Um, but, uh, you know, get the restaurant people and I'd love to hear why they're not able to permit uh, delivery. Well, perhaps we could get uh, people from the delivery services as well as restaurants to come to a future meeting and discuss the issues and the legal implications of allowing somebody who just to use the restroom, would you have to get their temperature? Would you have to get their signature? Obviously this is all during COVID until the COVID uh, epidemic is, is behind us. And this is much, much less of an issue, but obviously folks, folks need this discussion. And I think you've raised the discussion, um, but we have a few more hands. So let's I, I go. I just like to see it happen if possible well, at the next BCI meeting. I don't want to set your BCI's agenda. That's not my, Please, uh, 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 are you sure about then that? Then in May. Then in May. Yeah. Uh, okay. Now, uh, I, I will get to the Linda, and we will start. Okay. Gonna, let me just, just, this. Um, uh, uh, just a point of order here. So we're going to not vote on this tonight. So any. So just keep that in mind when you raise your hand to discuss this issue. We are not voting on this tonight. So if you stop a comment, keep your hand up, and we'll call on you. I do want to add too that there is a community member uh, who's been raising their hand, and I was yes, I was going to call on Erica now. next. And yeah. um, so you know, yeah, however you want, Andrew. I know you're going through again, but I want to make you aware that there is. Um, I see you've here. waited a long time, Erica. Would you like to speak? I can help to make it. I I, I will do this. So, Erica, you should be able to speak now. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. We yes. Can. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, this has been a great discussion, um, and I think it really speaks to the value of having multiple perspectives on the board. Um, and it also is the importance of having multiple voices that are not uh, yet, for various reasons, represented on the board. Um, so I wanted to just bring that out and, and say, in particular, I, I really appreciate hearing from the people who come from the business perspective and making sure that our small businesses are, are being um, spoken for. Um, but I wanted to take an opportunity because I think you've all spoken very well about the complexities of this. I think this also shows us an opportunity that we have a little bit of a broken system in how resolutions are introduced to the community board. And in the same way that the, um, the BCI felt a little bit blindsided here, that's really my experience as a new member of the public who's tried to get involved in the community board. And I would urge the full community board and in particular Stephen Brown to think about what we could do better going forward to make sure that resolutions are available to the public with enough time for us to digest them and to make sure that important voices have an opportunity to be part of the conversation, even if we're not on the community board. I think that's what makes for a stronger community is if we can come out and educate each other and speak our minds about things that we care about. Um, it's very hard sometimes to find what might be coming. Just as an example, here we are in a transportation meeting and you know it happens to be really a business issue. So I, I would um, urge you, uh, Stephen Brown and whoever else would participate in that conversation to think about a much more um, time sensitive uh, way to be transparent about upcoming resolutions for the board. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, we still have a few comments. Um, Linda, did you want to speak? Very quickly, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, 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 against uh, uh, the idea of maybe a special meeting. I'm going to talk to Christian about it. And I, I, I agree, Ken, there is an urgency here. No pun intended. Um, 
but uh, we can discuss it. We can discuss it with our B BCI members to see if they have the time and the bandwidth to do this. But um, I would be willing to do this if, if Christian, you know, maybe in the next week or so or the following yeah, week. So yeah, we'll, let's get, yeah, we'll get together and talk about it in the next few days. Okay? Yeah, because then we do have to invite the stakeholders. Yeah. We do want them there because this is this is really critically important. So yes, but thank you, and thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Linda. Doug. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, um, I am skeptical on the third party companies themselves, not the individual delivery workers, but the bigger companies. Uber Eats is a division of Uber. Uber is a massive company worldwide, billions of dollars behind them. There's DoorDash, there's Caviar, Seamless, Grubhub. Obviously, the restaurant industry has had some problems with some gouging of restaurants, and Grubhub and Seamless, the third party delivery companies, have not been so friendly. They've been really rough and Andrew Ridgey and the Hospitality Alliance have been doing an incredible job to try to even the playing field because it, 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 that, that's another issue. But I have to say that um, I am concerned about how the third party delivery companies are treating their independent contractors. I think, I assume they're independent contractors and not employees, although I don't know. Um, and I would love to talk to them about a lot of things, you know, um, it, it, how are they setting their their uh, workers up for safety? Um, whether they're providing them with lights and helmets and gear, and also encouraging them to ride safely in our community. So I would love those third party. Yep, lots of issues. Yeah, I'd love them to come. I would love to speak to them about all at all all of the above. Uh, I want to know about how, you know. What's their part in all this? So that's one of the many stakeholders, but I'd really like to hear from them because I don't remember, and perhaps it predates me, ever having any of these third-party delivery companies come to a BCI or our board at all to discuss their, you know, their role in this. Thank we you. had them in the past. We have. Thank Andrew, you. just for the record, the State Court of Appeals has ruled that these delivery guys are employees. Uh, the, the companies try to treat them as independent contractors, but the courts have ruled that they're employees for purposes of unemployment insurance and benefits and so forth to answer uh, Doug's question. Thanks. Thanks for that, Jay. Um, okay, so um, uh, Ken, did you have your hand up? Or is that from before? I from think before. it's from before. I'm, from before. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, mind. Rich, Rich, then you'll be the last one. Yeah, Unless just, yours is up from before as well. I just raised it again, building on uh, what was just said. I, I do think it is um, you know, because I think that there are big concerns with um, what the delivery cyclists are forced to do to meet the onerous terms of Grubhub or Seamless or Uber Eats. Uh, I do think we need to get them before us, but I do think it's also a transportation issue as well as a uh, BCI issue and uh, an HHS issue. Oh yeah, no, I think it's a, it's, it may be three committees as you just enumerated, health, BCI and transportation. I, I think, could we start them in the individual committees, the issues that are germane and then bring them together. And that may be one way to coordinate it so that there, we've got a, a fully developed comprehensive discussion. That assumes that they'd come back after one day and get through with them. You've got minutes. Yeah, yeah. Um, anything else on this topic? Hearing nothing, thank you for a very vigorous discussion. Um, it is certainly on everybody's radar now for sure. And Ken, you did accomplish something by bringing the issue up. That is for yes. sure. Thanks, so everyone. Don't, don't, yes, you did. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken. Uh, and thank now you, Andrew. And, and, and Howard. Oh, yeah. We're open to uh, new business now. I had a question uh, pertaining to old business. Go ahead. Old business um, presumes, predates new business. Yes, I thought so. <laughs> um, I, I guess this is mostly for Stephen. Um, uh, the resolution that we passed, the full board passed on the secondary street names. Um, who is that going to be sent to, and has that already happened? No, it has not. As you know, that we were down a little bit of staff, so we're getting a little organized. And thank you for the reminder. I'll work with John 
and traditionally it goes to either elect sort of a series of, de of decisions, which would be elected officials and or the departments that sort of make sense, whether it be DOT. But if you would like to kind of put a suggested ones that you'd like to, I'd certainly take it under consideration. Mm -hmm. I don't see why I wouldn't, but uh, it's usually a manual process that it's somewhat interrupted to giving the constraints. Um, but thank you for reminding me. I think we have to do all the ones and uh, we've got some meetings upcoming that would have triggered it either way. Uh, okay. But specifically to your answer, if you would like to make suggestions, I'm certainly open to that as well. And the goal is to get them out by the end of the week. I mean, meaning I, we know we have to do them and it's just running a little behind. Normally we try okay. to do it the same week. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank sure. you. Also under the heading of old business, Colleen, maybe you can update us on the outstanding matters that are that we've been waiting on, like the 72nd Street matter, um, daylighting, the other things that we're working on. And the 79th Street letter we sent. Right. And 106th Street. <laughs> oh, are you still there, Colleen? I think Colleen muted. Um, she can speak. So whether there's an issue, why don't you give Colleen a few moments? She's normally pretty good. Okay, why don't we I'm take- doing, I'm unmuted. There you so, are. Okay, great. Everyone, I will get back to you on the other issues, but I do have some good news about the 106 mid-block signal um, crossing. Oh, tell um, us. I mean, I, 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 it's good news, but I just, we just have to finalize one minor thing with signals. So I will get back to you next week, but it is positive. It is positive. That's wonderful to hear. Oh, Lee, that's such great news. We've been yes. working on it for a long time. Yeah. Yes, yes. Shelly will be thrilled. Yep. It's very positive, but don't share anything yet until nope. um, I have all the details from Signals that I will send to the community board. Thanks, okay? Colleen. Colleen, when you, you update on us, I assume you're going to do that by email. Could you include an update on the other outstanding matters as well, please? Definitely. I will do that. Okay. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Mm -hmm. uh, new, uh, business. new business. New business. Going once, uh, going twice. Uh, I see Lisa's hand is up. Um, Lisa, do you want to ask a question? Oh, you have old business. Can somebody unmute Lisa? Yeah, I'll do it. And while I do that, I will just give an informal update. They were on the 79th Street uh, um, uh, over on the, um, gosh, I need a cup of coffee. They were putting new lines over there. So uh, I was very happy about that. Oh, very good. Um, we're delineating. Which block, Steve? No, over at the um, rotunda. The, end. the rotunda. The rotunda. <laughs> exactly. I'm pretty dead. They were putting new lines for the rotunda that I was happy about. Well, that's going under construction soon, isn't it? And they still were putting them up, which I was happy about because they haven't been there forever, and it actually made a big difference. Um, that's I'm correct. We should be starting on that soon, just so you know. Should be starting yeah, this year. I, I, I thought, Colleen, that I that that is coming. So if you want to give more update, my understanding is it's eminent. And that's when I saw them. I said, well, maybe this is part of it. But they were putting on, uh, so, so they were carving out lines, which was, you know, even if it's temporary, it was dreadfully needed, right. desperately needed. Lisa, you are available to speak now. I made you. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much. So I wanted to go back to a resolution that passed the community board unanimously, 30 in favor with zero against abstentions are uh, present. Um, back in December of 2019, you guys passed a plan to improve the 10 most dangerous intersections. And I wanted to see where you were at with that, if anyone is spearheading that. I haven't seen any movement on that and wondering what's up. Um, we have repeatedly um, brought up the parts of those intersections with DOT. Um, and I know that 65th and Columbus uh, and the turn uh, eastbound there was one of them um, for, for traffic and pedestrians going at the same time and uh, a host of others too. Uh, Colleen, do you have any, are you, if you're still on here, do you have any info on those 10 worst intersections we brought to your attention way back, uh, I guess now December, 2019? I don't, but you know what? I'm going to pull the resolution and I'll see where we are with that. Um, and if, you know, I know it's probably been assigned since it's been 2019. So let me check with our- um, I think some of those have been corrected, but I'm not sure all of them have been. 
Yeah, I'll see. I'll check on the list. Well, we haven't even seen, it'd be interesting to see what is considered the 10 most dangerous intersections if we're actually looking at crashes and data. And, um, you know, it'd be interesting to me to see what the DOT and the precincts think are the 10 most dangerous intersections. You know, this is something that Stephen and I have been discussing about getting a database so we can have this information so it's easier for us to... Um, so it's something that will be is in the works. It just won't happen for a few months, but uh, at some point going forward, we will be creating a database to keep this kind no, of. No, that would be very useful. Obviously, and, and just, to, just to answer your question, Lisa. I mean, PD, um, the local precinct, they can always share with the community board the ten highest crash-prone locations. And once that information is shared, we can compare that with um, our DOT traffic planning division. Um, to see if that corresponds with what we have as well. Great. So, you, yeah. but, but there's just also clarify a couple of things yeah. just to add, because I, I asked about this question. Number one, to Andrew's point, I mean, I've, I've been chair since January. So we, we have been, I've been in several transportation meetings and I know that of those 10, you know, it often comes up and, and we've definitely talked about three or four. So to his point, it has not been, never talked about it. It has been referred to, and I do believe some of them have been discussed. The other point I'd say is I actually did ask uh, when I was on a meeting with um, with Colleen was on as well. I said, does DOT have a 10 most dangerous intersections? And they don't use that terminology from my understanding. They have. So that's kind of something I think we coined or maybe the police department. But I don't believe, according to the conversation that I had with Colleen and Ed Pinker, that there is a a list of the 10 most dangerous. So it's something we referred, and someone brought that up at a previous meeting. I, I think Rich Robbins started it and then we added to yeah. it. So just want you to be sure that's not their list. That's our list right. asking them to look at. So that's correct. That's correct. There is no such thing as a DOT 10 most dangerous things. I think they have ones that they're concerning, they have other databases, but just to be clear, someone asked me that once and I did make sure I asked that mm. question. But there are ways to look up the 10 most dangerous intersections. So if we could use, I, I, you know, I, I, crash map. Okay, I'm just tools. saying that, the, the, yeah. that everyone thought there was this universal list that no, everyone was referring no. to. And I was just trying to tell you that the our list of 10 that we're looking at, it, there is, and we can do that. I thought, I just wanted to clarify that because it came up at another And, and there are some intersections that we have said yeah. are potential really right. bad places. I seem to recall... Um, the community asked us to, and, and, and us yep. asking DOT to install a traffic light at Manhattan Avenue and 100th Street because there were a lot of near near misses there. So the fact yeah. that the, the accidents didn't actually happen, but they could have happened, is on our radar as well. Did our and resolution we include the t a list of 10? No, it didn't. It no. didn't. And going back to what Steve just mentioned, there is no such database that would have that information. Mm -hmm. That's why I mentioned, because I know when I go to traffic stat with the precincts, they always talk about their highest crash prone locations. Mm -hmm. And when that comes up, they would ask DOT, can you take a look and see if you can re-engineer this particular location or, or if you can educate the pedestrians? And that's how we would know. And um, in many cases, the precincts would also send us traffic intel reports highlighting what are the major concerns that they have with that intersection. So that's why I mentioned that it's good to also check with the local precinct to find out what are their highest 10 crash prone location. And that's based on their, you know, the crash data that, that they collect and compile at that particular intersection. Yeah. That Great. makes sense. Clarify Andrew that. or Howard, could you do that? Could someone from the committee actually do that? Reach out to the police and get that. We we, we frequently do, um, but we will try to get them to uh, assemble a list. That would help. Great. That would be helpful. Yeah, I'd love to see it. We will do that. Thanks, Colleen. Um, Rich's hand is up. Go ahead, Rich. Yeah, I just want to comment on this. Um, I, I had done a lot of work on this and worked with both the precincts and with Colleen and Ed. Um, and we had put together a list. Um, just uh, the, the, There's a lot of nuance to it. There's a lot of figuring yeah. out um, how do you define uh, the most dangerous intersections? And is it by the number of killed? Is it by the number of serious injured? Um, is it by the number of near misses? 
I had, when I was removed from transportation, I did email to um, all the transportation members uh, the emails with all the work that had been done already. Uh, as I've said in the past, uh, you know, this was something that was put on hold during COVID. I think it could be brought back right now, uh, but it takes a lot of effort. It, and the idea was that we'd be meeting on a regular basis with both the precincts and with Colleen and Ed, uh, just to go through, um, first of all, just making the list, making sure that we know what those 10 intersections are and that everyone's agreed on uh, what the list is and then tackling them on a one-by-one -one basis, really looking at uh, each of those intersections, figuring out what can be done, both from a design perspective and from an enforcement perspective, uh, and trying to make improvements on each one. Uh, and ideally, you know, once you work on each intersection, hopefully it goes down and is no longer on the top ten list, and you raise other ones and you address. That was them. my point. If we have if we have called DOT's attention to a particularly bad intersection where there's been a lot of accidents, and DOT actually changes. The, uh, the signal to make it safer, does that location then come off of the most dangerous list? And does the dangerous list go down to nine or does another place get added so that we always have 10? If, if the America's most wanted gets arrested, then someone else goes on the uh, America's Someone list. else, yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, it's a, an ongoing effort though, just you know, looking at the list and figuring out um, which ones need to be addressed. And then and the idea was that we'd be looking at, at least at one intersection each month and doing it on a regular basis to, to tackle this and to um, make an impact just, you know, because we know there's a lot of data we know what the, the dangerous intersections are. And it's a way to keep the committee focused and make sure that the committee is focused on those intersections where you know, it's most likely that there will be serious injuries or fatalities. And I'm guessing that as soon as the 79th Street Rotunda work starts, um, there may be a, a new couple of more dangerous intersections it, when it, traffic is diverted to other 95th, 96th Street locations. Yeah, but it's also, you know, over the years that I was closely tracking the data, we knew where the crashes were most likely to be. On a regular basis, the same intersections would have the most crashes on a, an ongoing basis. And so the idea is to just get that list we'll, we'll reach out to the two precincts and try to get their current their current list and send it around to the committee members yeah but then and it's also Richard. someone who's arranging the meetings meeting with them and and you know, tackling them one by one on, a, on an ongoing basis yeah i think so um, andrew, any other item yes andrew can i just say one more thing um Go ahead, Lisa. thank you for answering that question and taking that on um i wanted to make sure that everyone here was invited to our event coming up. Um, I mentioned it at full board, but on April 24th, we are um, hosting a really fun event called Street Arts. It's on the open street on West 103rd Street at Broadway. And we're gonna have um, a lot of singing and dancing and art um, and just out enjoying the street. So I hope you'll join. It's from noon until about five and um, you'll see a lot oh, of- I hope you have good weather. I know. <laughs> We can't have a rain date because of the way DOT and Steve of and SAFO work, but um, but hopefully we will be having good weather. Yes, so please join. Great, us. thank you for that. I just wanted to close up a couple of things. First of all, Lisa, I did get your email and did share it with him, uh, share it with the office. So hopefully they'll put it in a newsletter and, and uh, happy you were able to announce it. And uh, if you come to steering, we can announce it as well to support thank those you. efforts. And I just did want to close, Andrew and, and Howard. Happy to talk more about this sort of dangerous dangerous streets. I mean. The, the nature of it was to sort of get organized. And I'm, I'm just saying there seemed to be, um, there seemed to be some misunderstanding on what this list was and who was working on it. That's why I had an extensive conversation with Colleen and Ed about it. So, you know, I'm just saying, I think there seemed to be a disagreement about this list and what it was, but I think we should certainly pick it up. Uh, I'll work on it with you and I'm sure we can find other um, you know, under, uh, we can find other transportation committee members to pick it up, but there, there was a, at least from my conversation, some misunderstanding about what this list was or not, and perhaps getting that organized. You mean who compiled the list? They're just DOT wasn't aware of a list. So, I mean, okay. um, they did not know of this and whether there's a miscommunication or a semantic issue and Colleen knows that we talked about it. So, you know, getting sort of organized would be a first step and we can figure out and we've got great great transportation committee members that I think could sort of lead the charge as well. And I'd be willing to work on it with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Is that uh, it? Any other, any other issues to bring up? 
If not, we will take a motion to adjourn. And thanks to everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, yeah. folks. Have a good Have night. A good night. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.